Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Urban Update. I'm Byron Barnett. On the show today, a respected painter, educator, and mentor in Boston for over 30 years opens his solo exhibition in almost a decade. Also on the program, a very special reason for me wearing this pink tie. I'll explain later. But up first, Last month, the U.S. attorney found that Boston Latin School violated federal civil rights law in failing to properly address an incident of racial harassment at the school. The Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Social Justice was among the groups who jointly filed a complaint with the U.S. Attorney's Office calling for an investigation. Now, the committee is also calling for Boston Public Schools to revise ex exam school admissions policy so that Boston Latin, the crown jewel of our education system here, is more representative of this great city. Now, our, the Lawyers Committee has also chimed in on ballot initiative number two in the upcoming election. To tell us more about their positions, we've invited attorney Ivan Espinoza Madrigal, executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Econo Economic Justice. Also, attorney Matt Krager. He is the Education Project Director for the Lawyers Committee. Gentlemen, welcome to Urban Update. Thanks for coming in. Thank you, Byron. Uh, maybe I can start with you, um, Ivan. Uh, let's begin, sure. I guess, with the current situation. Can you sort of tell our viewers, um, give our viewers a brief synopsis of where we stand at Boston Latin? Well, the, the events at Boston Latin, which have been dominating the airwaves for, for some time now, started uh, back when a couple of African-American students commented on their experience, the racial harassment that they were um, subjected to at Latin, and the fact that school officials were not really taking those complaints seriously, Byron. And so um, uh, once this information got out into the public, we, along with many of our allies, including the NAACP, were very concerned about uh, the quality of uh, Boston Latin for all students, right, and especially students who are particularly vulnerable to this type of, of harassment and bullying. And so we filed an, um, a complaint with the U.S. Attorney's Office, and that complaint was filed on behalf of, um, of a number of other organizations as well who joined us in that effort. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. Attorney launched a, a federal investigation into these uh, circumstances and found that there was a violation of federal law. And so what we have here is um, actually a very rare instance of um, enforcing federal civil rights compliance this far north of the south, and it's happening, like you said, in our crown jewel. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Matt, uh, Matt Crager, there are many different views on the way this all came down. I guess, what are your thoughts on just the way the way this this whole, this developed. Yeah. So, uh, speaking particularly to the U.S. Attorney's Office investigation, uh, as Yvonne mentions, uh, they brought to bear the weight of Title IV of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It's the same law that the Department of Justice used to litigate scores of school desegregation cases throughout the country. Um, and uh, what our courts have done, as well as the Department of Justice has done, is set a very high bar for what qualifies as actionable racial harassment in the context of a school because in order for a court to see that or indeed for the U.S. attorney to see it, not only do they have to see severe harassment, but they also have to see that the school was deliberately indifference in its response, right? That it practically turned a blind eye to it. And when the U.S. attorney, in conjunction with the Department of Justice, found a violation of that federal civil rights law, it suggests not only you know, validating the concerns that the parents had um, as, as one child in particular uh, was significantly racially harassed, but also that the school could have done a lot more, indeed fell below the bar of our federal civil rights law in response. And we think um, uh, our court set that bar very high for a reason, and it's important that this was a finding here. Using the 1964 civil rights law uh, to uh, enforce this, that is, I find that amazing. Now, uh, there's another issue with Boston Latin, the decrease in diversity mm -hmm. of the student population. Um, what, uh, what about that? Mm -hmm. So we're now, um, uh, at this point, uh, we have a district that is about 75% black and Latino. 
But Boston Latin, the oldest public school in the country and certainly the crown jewel of our system, is approximately 20% black and Latino. So our school doesn't reflect uh, the great diversity of our city and uh, perhaps somewhat disconcertingly, although it's a school for all of our children, um, uh, there is practically a majority of students who are attending from private schools and not uh, uh, experiencing the reward of long participation in our Boston public school systems and earning a seat. I, I, I was going to say, now how does that happen? How do you, yeah. if you have a, a, a district, a school district that mm -hmm. is, you know, three quarters, you know, black and Latino, how does the school end up nearly almost 50 percent uh, white? Mm -hmm. yeah. well, so we see a couple of concerns. Um, Latin, uh, since the end of the voluntary integration efforts in Boston, has adopted a two-part entrance to the school. One is participation in a high-stakes exam, and the other is your grades as a sixth grader. Now, um, our concerns are twofold there. First, we know that there are a lot of families paying a lot of money for a lot of test prep in order to do well on that test, something that some of our families of lower socioeconomic status aren't as positioned to do. Second, um, there's a great deal of variation in the way that we grade our students from one Boston public school to another, from our public schools to our charter schools, and certainly from our public schools and charter schools and our parochial schools that comprise our city. It makes it very hard to figure out what is the way that we make sure our best and brightest from all over our city earn a seat at our flagship school. Now, uh, Ivan, I guess the Globe's, uh, Boston Globe's Alex Beam, uh, he wrote that improving diversity at uh, Boston Latin would mean abandoning uh, meritocratic, meritocratic principles. How do you respond to that? that that's really upsetting because at, at the end of the day, Byron, this conversation that, that we're having, right, that Matt's talking about, it's about having everyone in our city reflected in our institutions. And so th this isn't about uh, about abandoning meritocratic principles, this is about making these institutions even more democratic. And uh, there are many models for admissions that could be explored, right? Matt just described the two things that this school takes into consideration. Why don't we go with a policy such as the one that the Supreme Court of the United States just upheld in terms of university admissions uh, in UT Austin, where it said, you know, top 10% students from high schools across Texas can earn a seat at the crown jewel of that state's university system, right? Why can't we do that with high schools in Boston and say, if you are an excellent student at any public school in Boston, if you excel, you can earn a seat at Boston Latin. Or alternatively, base admissions on neighborhoods or zip codes. Use other methods of making sure that we are creating pipelines that actually reflect the rich diversity in our community. Now, currently, admissions are determined by grades and standardized tests. Standardized tests. Isn't that the best way to keep uh, an elite school at the highest standards? We have seen, especially in the higher education context in this country, a holistic assessment of students, and that has maintained the standards and prestige at universities and colleges across this country, which are a lot more diverse than what Boston Latin looks like. I think that this is not about maintaining the status quo. This is about using our creativity to make sure that we are maintaining the same standards, but making sure that all of our students are coming together and learning together. Now, uh, earlier this month, the Suffolk Superior Court dismiss, dismissed a lawsuit that challenged, we're kind of jumping here over to okay. question two, we've just got a couple of minutes left here, uh, about the charter schools, uh, dismissed a lawsuit uh, that challenged the constitutionality of the cap on charter schools in Massachusetts. Now, the Lawyers Committee represented the Boston and the uh, regional NAACP, along with a group of students <laughs> from Boston schools who asserted that, they said that their educations would be harmed were the caps declared unconstitutional. Now, why do these students and the NAACP get involved in this lawsuit, and what effect does the suit have on ballot question two? Sure. So um, we were very proud to stand behind the NAACPs, both locally and regionally, and these students. Um, uh, 
here's what happened. Right? We've got this issue around charter schools in Massachusetts that's become such a lightning rod, so saturated, right? so political, um, to the point that we seem to be talking past each other, uh, even on the street. And um, what I think the court did in this case was cut through the saturation and look very plainly at our school funding laws. Now, our education laws, be they state or federal, were designed so that our schools have to take all comers, make sure that any child shows up, uh, gets a seat, and gets an education. And we want that to be a quality education. Um, what our school funding laws were designed to do was to make sure that there would be a baseline below which the funds that are needed to make that happen, things would not fall. When we found a lawsuit that would eliminate the charter cap, that would have eliminated that safety net and destroyed the modest amount of stability that our public schools can expect when serving all of our students. And that's particularly troubling in places like Boston and throughout Massachusetts, where indeed our English language learners and our students with disabilities, particularly those with the most severe needs, are disproportionately underserved in charters. And what effect does this lawsuit, uh, the dismissal of this lawsuit, have on, on the ballot question very quickly? Well, at the end of the day, we've seen that, that there are people who are trying to lift the cap by any means necessary through the legislature, in courts, in the ballot initiative. In, this, in the court case, they were not successful, right? Mm -hmm. And they tried to do the same thing they're trying to do with the ballot initiative in court, and they failed. Now, we have to be careful here because yeah. uh, obviously this is a hot button issue, and there are yeah. many uh -huh. people, it's on the ballot, and yes. we don't have anyone here That's right. uh, in favor of, uh, mm -hmm. of raising the cap, we, which people say that it would give uh, people more, give students more opportunities. And Byron, no, we don't but, deny that there are students who found mm -hmm. educational homes in charter schools. That's a wonderful thing. And as an organization, we are certainly not anti-charter. Um, the concern we have is that when we look for solutions for all of our students, that we not find ways to put schools in competition with each other, but find ways to support the learning of all of our children. Okay, and I guess we'll have to leave it right there, and we'll see uh, what voters say about question two. Uh, right. and, um, and just. Uh, less than two weeks now. That's Matt Craiger and uh, Yvonne Espinoza Madrigal, thank you both for coming in. Thank you very thank much. You. Okay, when we come back, a respected painter, educator, and mentor in Boston for over 30 years opens his solo exhibition in nearly a decade. All the details right here on Urban Update.